Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dan Crafton, Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and our new patron, Phil. Welcome, Phil. Woo-woo. On this episode of DTNS, is Threads bringing back TweetDeck? Are you going to buy the new streaming service called Venue Sports? And did Jason Howell survive Google I.O.? Spoiler, he did. And he's here to tell us all about it. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 16th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. I'm Jason Howell, the other, other tech titan from Petaloom. I'm going to keep saying that. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Jason Howell, it's so good to have you here. Uh, it yeah. has been a minute. I mean, y- you and I talk on the internet. Yeah. I think we all probably talk on the internet. But so fun to have you on the show, especially after a probably grueling I.O. news week for you. But uh, thanks for being yeah. here. Yeah, it feels like a minute, but then when I look at this week, it it feels like years because holy moly, I got hit over the head with a large boulder that said AI on it. And so, well, yeah. uh, you know, luckily, uh, you you not only cover all things Google, but all things AI. So true. It was it was kind of like yeah, it was it was chocolate and peanut butter week for me. Perfect. Yeah, Yeah, it's my favorite kind of ice cream. All right. uh, Without further ado, let's get into the show, starting with the quick hits. The European Commission launched a formal investigation into Meta to determine if Meta violated the Digital Services Act by contributing to children's social media addictions and not keeping kids safe and private enough. The commission wants to examine whether Meta is properly assessing and acting against those risks brought on by its platform's interfaces. Investigators will also review how Meta protects young users from harmful content, including things like strong age verification and clear privacy tools with good defaults for minors. Google fixed its third actively exploited Chrome zero day vulnerability in a week and its seventh this year. In a security advisory published on Wednesday, Google said it is aware that an exploit for CVE 2024-4947 exists in the wild. Chrome users should get updates automatically when the security patches are available, but users can also confirm they're running the latest version by going to the Chrome menu, help about Google Chrome, letting the update finish, and then clicking on the relaunch button to install it. As tensions between the U.S. and China continue to escalate, the Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft is asking 700 to 800 employees in its China-based cloud computing and artificial intelligence operations units to consider transferring to other regions. The staff, mostly Chinese national engineers involved in machine learning, were given the opportunity to relocate to the U.S., Ireland, Australia, or New Zealand. The offers were uh, were moved to made earlier this week, and employees have until early June to make up their minds on whether or not they would like to move or stay where they are. TikTok confirmed to TechCrunch that it is testing uploads of 60-minute videos to a limited group of users in select markets. TikTok says it doesn't have any immediate plans to make the feature available widely, but this is a departure from the platform, which originally only allowed 15-second videos, but has increased the limits over the years. This move has TikTok competing even more directly with YouTube, which also embraces long-form content. Last year, Peacock made episode one of Killing It available to watch for free on TikTok, but users had to consume it in five parts. This may be an evolution of how TV brands offer content on TikTok. Can I just say real quick, related to TikTok, if, if you yes, don't mind, you I just learned yeah. I just learned that you can do a horizontal video on TikTok as of not very long ago also. So it's just weird to me. I how, think how that also plays works. into the story, you know, <laughs> yeah. that yeah, long form, weird. you know, yeah, 16 by nine type stuff. Why did why is the old new again? Why why is it a huge deal when when TikTok, you know, does long form uh horizontal video? I don't know. But <laughs> well, speaking of old being new again, uh this one you'll love this one, Jason. Netflix announced it's launching its own advertising technology platform to compete with industry bigwigs like Google, Amazon, and Comcast. You know, 
little companies you probably have never heard of. Uh, no, they're big ad companies. Netflix entered the ad business about a year and a half ago, offering less expensive plans with ads, which was lucrative for the company at the time. The company initially partnered with Microsoft to develop its ad tech and catch up to rivals like Hulu. This change in approach seems to be Netflix's attempt, attempt to take full control of its own advertising future. All right, Rob and Jason, I know you're all on Threads. Um, Threads being the, you know, not the only Twitter or X alternative, uh, but certainly one that has uh, yeah, picked up a lot of steam over the last year. So let's talk about what Meta is doing here. Uh, Meta obviously being the parent company of Threads. Meta is starting to test a new experience for Threads today. This is Thursday as we're recording this, letting users create customizable feeds that are stacked in a horizontal column interface on the web. Now you might say, huh, this sounds familiar. And you would be right because a lot of other people are also comparing it to Twitter's TweetDeck, which was at one point, a standalone service, a third-party service. Twitter purchased TweetDeck back in 2011, um, and it, you know, it remained uh, beloved for many people who liked TweetDeck's um, uh, uh, layout and 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 offerings. Then it became a paid paid service and was rebranded to X Pro last year. This was part of X rebranding lots of things within you know what was formerly Twitter. It now costs eight dollars per month. Meta tells The Verge, those in the test can choose to add separate columns for things like favorite searches, tags, accounts, save posts, notifications, and can choose to have specific columns auto-update in real time. Now, this would potentially replace the For You feed every time that you visit threads on the web. Some users complain about that. I don't know. I don't think it's that big a deal myself, but threads does have a real-time following feed you have to bookmark either that URL or just like press the, uh, you know, press the uh, following from for you every time that you load the page. All right. So, so Rob, I know you have thoughts, um, but Jason, I want to start with you. How much uh, does a tweet deck experience on threads excite and delight you or, or the opposite? Excite and delight. I mean, I was a fan of TweetDeck um, for a long time, just just for the fact that, like, I feel like at least with Twitter, you know, I had my my follower count was enough that with TweetDeck, I felt like I could make a little better sense of what was going on. Um, then it was, you know, it was pulled away from us and put behind a paywall, and I was sad for a moment, and then I got over it. Threads has always been. Like, yes, I use threads on a semi-regular basis. I definitely update it. Um, you know, when I'm updating Twitter slash X, I usually go on to threads and do it. But every time I cut over there, like it's so it does it feels a little under kind of served. It feels very, you know, if you've got your threads account on a wide on a widescreen monitor and the browser is full, you know, it's still this like narrow part of the, the center. It just feels very untouched. And so I guess like, am I going to use this to the same extent that I used a tweet deck on Twitter? I don't know. I'll certainly tr test it out and I'm sure I will opt for this if, and when given the chance over the current interface. Cause I just feel like the current interface is so sparse. It's it, like, it, it needs a refresh. It needs some extra energy to it. Yeah. And Rob, you and I were talking before the show about, you know, there are certain things about threads that you are still wondering, you know, why don't they roll out this feature? Totally. Yeah. So the big thing to, to me here that was not announced is that they made no mention of list or groups. So, yeah, I guess it's cool if I can create a column and follow one user in it. But I would love to be able to create a column and have an entire list or group of users that I'm following or a topic that I'm following, which actually makes this new view much more useful to me, you know, as compared to trying to follow one person at a time. Now, we don't know. Maybe that is something that they will add. 
But when I look at this, it, you know, when I look at this system, I was a huge, huge, huge user of TweetDeck. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I used it more than I would ever even go to the the, the standard Twitter interface or X interface. Uh, how useful this would be. Searches are kind of mm -hmm. okay, but I really want to be able to say, here's 11 people that talk about this thing that I want to follow and see their messages whenever they come up. And I don't see that as being something that that Threads is about to offer at this point. Yeah, I you know threads. I I'm all in on threads. I I I enjoy threads. I I read more than I post there. But um, there is something about <laughs> I'm gonna call it Twitter just because we're you know we're hearkening back to the the olden days. But you know when I go to X slash Twitter, I you know I'm kind of like all right, sure a lot of people may have bounced out to other places, but you know you got trending topics. I know what mm -hmm. sports Twitter is doing. You know, I, I know what late night Twitter is doing. Like this is something that threads either, either has to say, we don't want to be, you know, the next Twitter. We want to do things differently. And it feels as though a lot of uh, the slow rollouts of all things threads have been uh, directly to be like, we're not like Twitter. We're doing our own thing and trying to figure out what people want going forward in the year 2024. But I don't know. It's hard to recreate that. It really is. It's, mm -hmm. you know, doing your own thing is cool. But when you have enormous amounts of people who would probably be the power user saying, we want this, we want that, and you don't do those things, eventually those folks go other places where those things are actually happening. So that's just, that's a balancing act that I think Threads is going to have to play. Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. <sighs> So moving on, the Disney Fox Warner Brothers Discovery Sports streaming joint venture has officially gotten a name, Venue Sports. The company's name and logo were announced Thursday. That's today. That's, uh, you know, the service's CEO, uh, Pete Distad. That is who's running this thing. Pricing hasn't been officially announced yet, but the service is set to debut in the fall, even though it faces legal challenges from Fubo, it's another streaming service, and some industry and regulatory resistance. Venue Sports, and that's V-E-N-U. Get it? <laughs> Maybe it's Venue, but it's probably Venue. Uh, sports. <laughs> venue Sports, uh, we'll call it Venue uh, for the purposes of our discussion, is going to aggregate linear feeds with 14 sports-centric networks and certain direct-to-consumer services. So the company projects 5 million subscribers within five years, and that also suggests it would be more of a complement to a pay TV bundle rather than a major threat. Wall Street analysts and industry observers are wondering what this is going to cost and have predicted that venue sports might cost upwards of $40 a month or more. Seems like consolidation and bundles and aggregation are the play for streaming industries in 2024. Boy, has this been a theme on DTNS as of late. So do we think a potentially $40 or more per month streaming package for some sports is worth it to consumers? I think it depends on the sports combo, obviously. Like um, some like to have it all, and there are certainly services out there that give you a little bit more of a comprehensive thing. It seems I don't know very much about Fubo, but apparently, you know, in kind of reading up about this article, Fubo or Fubo has a pretty comprehensive offering if you go down that add-ons road. This, like what I'm trying to understand about this is, is it like lots of different types of sports just a handful of games from each sport or is it you know like this is just very good for these particular sports and the other ones we don't have and i like i don't know if he, if either of you have heard what that is but if that's the case then it really comes down to does this service have you know the the sport that you're looking for and maybe i'm the wrong person to actually weigh in on this because i don't watch <laughs> yes. a huge amount of sports so i'm i'm pretty satisfied with a small amount you know but uh you know people are real they're they're real particular about their sports coverage and well so, rob yeah. with the yeah. nfl and the nba potentially being part of this bundle i mean that sounds pretty promising right that sounds pretty promising and, and jason you hit the nail on the head here you know does it offer the sports that we want so uh w one of the notes here was that this is intended you know um in some ways for younger subscribers who just never want the cable route who are just you know they might be doing terrestrial tv but they're just they never signed up cable and 
is this a way to get them in? It could be a way to get folks like me in as well, because I am a cord cutter. I've gotten rid of cable. And when I think about, you know, my Hulu plus live TV, I honestly really only watch sports live on that platform. So mm-hmm. if, 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 if venue is going to have like the TNT, if TNT keeps it, or if it, I get, that potentially, I guess could go to, to NBC, but if, if it still has NBA basketball, if it still has, you know, football, if it still has baseball games and stuff like that, then maybe it could, it could grab someone like me, but it has to be the sports that I actually am interested in. And if I find myself, well, I've got to go get this other thing to get that game. And I got to go get this other thing to get that game. Staying fractured may actually be darn near as cost effective as trying to sign up to one bundle that has a lot, but not necessarily everything that I'm looking for. Yeah. I mean, that's why to this day, I, I know there are other options, but YouTube TV is my cable alternative. I'm a cord cutter as well, <laughs> but I'm like, YouTube TV is darn near as much cable as, you know, I, I ever experienced in the past. Um, and the price has gone up, but it's still less expensive than it used to be. But I really only use it for sports, everything else I can get on demand in other ways. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm, uh, really trying to, you know, see something at a certain time. Like I don't even watch Jeopardy at 7 PM. <laughs> I watch it when I want to. Um, but, um, but do, you, do uh, you keep your YouTube TV subscription all the time? Like, is that an always subscribe or drop in? I, and out? I, ha- I have, you know, in, in leaner months, I've been like, you know, Super Bowl's yeah. over. I, I, mean, I can I can go up a few months, but for the most part now I'm 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 pretty dedicated to it at this point. I, I think and maybe it's a testament to how little TV I find time to watch these days, but I, I am I know there's a there's a name for it where it's serial something where you only sign up for a subscription service for a serial churner. That's what serial churner. Uh, or a churner. churner. Just a churner wait, in wait, general. I, I think like, Rob would identify as one. Yeah. If yeah, I'm not I mean, mistaken, if, you know, like, you watch for, your show and then you don't have to, you know, keep paying the service until you want to watch another show. And they allow you to do that. So I don't yeah. think I don't personally, I don't see anything wrong with that. But like this summer, the Olympics are happening. And, you know, th- so there's there's very like key moments where I care about sports, so the Olympics or the Super Bowl or maybe the playoffs leading up to the Super Bowl. And those are the moments where I consider paying for a service to get you know, to, to be able to watch those games without any headaches. And so I guess to that end, you know, if they're, if they're offering a $40 per month, instead of having to pay $80 for a YouTube TV for a month to get the the Olympics, I'm not certain that they're going to be able to cover the Olympics necessarily, but I'm just using it as an example, then I would certainly consider that. Yeah. Well, we're about to talk uh, a lot more about AI, (laughs) but just a reminder, if you want to know about all things artificial intelligence, we have got the show for you. You should listen to AI Named the Show. Each week, Tristan Jutra and Tasia Custodi keep you informed about the ever so fast moving AI world, because boy, is it moving fast. Catch it at AINamedtheshow.com. Well, Jason, we're so excited to have you on the show today because uh, we talked on Monday that OpenAI had launched its latest LLM, GPT-4.0, with the company showcasing multimodal capabilities in a live stage demo, something that Google didn't totally replicate when I.O. launched uh, with its keynote on Tuesday at the time. On Monday, OpenAI said it would be free with no subscription required. But we have gotten a lot of uh, a, a lot from IO. You know, on Tuesday, Google announced a lot of Gemini related services. We got Gemini Nano. We have Gemini getting integration into Google Workspace, uh, Gemini Teammate for Google Docs, Gmail, Gemini Astra, uh, Visual Chatbot. Um, Gemini 1.5, uh, uh, which is best when you're maybe not in uh, the 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 best area for internet access. But we have talked about this um, from afar. Jason, you were actually at I.O., so tell us about it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a Google I.O., which, I mean, you know, think it back to the keynote is sitting in that room or that room, the Shoreline Amphitheater. Um, <laughs> I don't think there was a single announcement that didn't have AI attached to it in some way, shape or form, which is really just an, you know, absolutely a testament to how badly Google wants you to think of them when you think of AI in this moment where everybody's popping off with their own AI features. So many of them are accelerating and developing and, and improving in similar but different ways. And that's kind of, I think, what we're talking about here. I mean, you know, it for me, being there, not watching it on a screen, but being in the, in, in the place where it was happening, it still ended up feeling like a ton of noise. At a certain point, it was just so much AI and this, this feature goes over here and that feature goes over there and this, this context and that tokens. And I mean, it was just it, <laughs> at a certain point, it was white noise, right? It's hard to keep up, but um, that's just where we are right now. Everything, if they aren't, doing something major with AI, these you know, these big tech companies, then they are left in the dust right now. They have to keep up. And Google really wanted to make that clear that they were there. Yeah, Google definitely uh, cannot lose this race. They they have to be a key player in it. And I'm, I'm going to channel something that Tom Merritt said on Tuesday's show when, you know, when IO first kicked off. I don't know that anything that Google announced would make me switch. If, 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 for example, if I were in Microsoft's ecosystem and I used Office products and I, you know, had access to Copilot and all the stuff that Microsoft is doing, would anything that Google announced make me switch? Probably not. But there's a lot of stuff that they announced that makes me say, oh, I would turn that on in Gmail. Oh, I would turn that on in Google Docs. Oh, I would turn that on in Google Sheets. Um, so there's some kind of cool things there. So, um, you know, I, I think that the industry kind of, uh, you know, believes that Google is behind a bit. I don't know for normal folks that that makes a lot of difference just because so many people use their services. So many people use Google Photos. So many people use uh, Gmail. So many people use Docs that if you're already there and you're getting these new AI features, that might be something that just keeps you in Google's, uh, yeah. you know, I don't want to say a walled garden, but keeps you in their, in their marketplace as compared to going and testing these things out in something else that you may have to pay for. I, I, I think you're spot on. That's, that's exactly what Google is banking on here. And that's been their plan. You know, we saw this last year at IO for sure. Uh, this year, I mean, it, tripling down, quadrupling down on this idea that like, Google believes that you shouldn't have to go anywhere to find their AI. If you are already a Google user, a user of Google products, you should find their AI embedded into all these places. And it has been, there's been Gemini, you know, in, in Gmail and Docs and all these places. And even, even still, it's hard to find it. And when you do find it, like I've talked to some of my, uh, you know, non-techie friends and, you know, they find out that I do an AI podcast. And so we start talking about AI and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm a workspace user. I started testing out some of the, the AI that's integrated. I'm like, oh, what did you think? They were like, it didn't do anything the, the way I thought it should. Like it was useless. It was, but you know, it was nothing but criticism, which just makes me think like, all right, Google, it's, it's excellent. It's amazing to go on for two hours about the, you know, hundred plus you know, different products and ways in which you're integrating AI into your stuff, but you got to stick the landing. And if, and if you are, if you are presenting this on all these surfaces in a way that all of these people that don't follow this stuff are noticing it and trying it, they better enjoy it on the other end. Otherwise they're not going to give it a second thought. And so that, I think that's a big challenge for Google. Google doesn't have the best track record when it comes to sticking the landing on things. Uh, being down at Shoreline Amphitheater, which was where the um, the keynote happened, and you know, it, I don't know, it, it, probably hanging out with uh, friends who want to talk about mm -hmm. Google products and stuff. Sure. Just what? How did you? You know, what was the? You know, the temperature of the of the crowd? Did you feel like people were like, okay, we're gonna get you OpenAI or something different? Yeah, really depends on who you ask, right? The people who were there to attend the event, there were there were developers and stuff. I think there was a little more excitement on the developer side than there were on the kind of like the journalist press box side, which is more of what I was kind of close to from a vicinity perspective and a lot of the people that I was talking. Uh, in general, I would say that I think people who were probably watching the keynote online, like streaming, 
probably thought it was a lot more bowling, boring and dull than the people who were there. There was there was energy there. There was excitement. The Project Astra moment where she, um, you know, if you haven't seen it, it's this multimodal kind of a demonstration video where the, the woman is walking around with a phone and identifying things and conversing with it. Very similar in many ways it, to what it, OpenAI it showed really off. really impressive. Yeah, it was an impressive video, but when it gets to about halfway through and she's like, where are my glasses? Did you happen to see my glasses? And the context of the system allows it to be like, oh, yeah, it's over there by the red apple. And then she picks up the glasses and puts it on and starts interacting with everything through the glasses view. That was a moment where everybody in the crowd was like, oh, OK, boom, there you go. And I, I have had, had these this pair of Google glasses, my like set prop all damn week because it keeps coming in handy. But <laughs> Google's been doing this for a really long time. They were you know, notably probably earliest, one of the earliest peop, uh, companies to try and go down this road. They keep trying at it. But I'm telling you, this is where AI is headed. A, the, and even the stuff that OpenAI is, is showing off with, with GPT-40 is we, you know, if we can get to a point to where we no longer have to have that separate wall of glass that we have to hold up in front of ourselves to do all these things. And it's just kind of with us in an experience that, in a, in a way that isn't, um, you know, overwhelming and this huge block of, of metal on our face. Like if it's just a pair of sunglasses that we would normally wear, but it does these things, bam, you've got, you've got a killer, killer feature right there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Apple Vision Pro um, having a really hard time <laughs> being like, you know, extremely exciting, innovative, everything. And people mm. are like, I don't want to wear that. Yeah, it's, you know? yeah. Like, so. where's the where's the value proposition and put this giant, you know, brick on your face and the world is is much better and more beautiful. It's like, yeah, but the, it's also warm and it's also heavy. And it's also just not the way I want the world to see me. I want the world to see me the way I am and get these benefits. I do think we're going to get there when it comes to these wearables. So, Jason, I know that in addition to, you know, to Android, you, you definitely are into A.I., and OpenAI did their event that was much shorter on, on Monday. What yeah. specifically did you think about ChatGPT 4.0 and just some of the multimodal stuff that they're going to be doing? Yeah, I mean, there, there, no question, you know, they they got out ahead of IO. It was kind of scheduled last minute. They really wanted to kind of beat the news and also set the set the kind of uh, the 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 pr the cycle, the news cycle around the comparisons. And there's a lot to compare between the two. I mean, I personally, I thought the OpenAI um, GPT 4.0 demonstration was pretty dang impressive. I think some of the things that that stood out to me, the things that have been limiting factors in my mind, that suddenly these voices voice chat bots, um, you know, getting a better, a greater, wider uh, set of context or, or window of context that was demonstrated there. Also, just the conversational aspect, which some some might argue, you know, making these chatbots sound more human is unnecessary. I don't know that I agree with that. When when you've got the latency that they've cut down to this point, that's very similar, very close to how we converse as human beings. There's not. I ask it a question and then I wait for those five seconds that feel like five hours before it comes back. That really slows you down and it makes it less of a utility that you want to converse with. Um, GPT-40 kind of demonstrated uh, a much you know narrower window of, of latency. But I do want to point out that the GPT-40 and the voice um, that they that they were demonstrating, very California, very Valley Girl. And, a, and just a little too flirty for my comfort level. Like it starts to get into a realm of like weirdness. I have not like, heard somebody oh. say it's too flirty, but yeah, you know, I mean, I'm kind of with you on this. I didn't know how to like put my finger on it, but I was like, I don't need a new best friend. Yeah, I don't need that. You and know, you know, of like, course, everybody I, I ends need, up comparing I just, to her. I just, right? I want you to do the yes. Uh, a lot of comparisons to the movie Her. If you haven't seen it, I mean, it feels very much like that. But yeah, like I, I, I feel like if I say like, well, it shouldn't be this human, then someone's going to be like, well, what do you want, Sarah? Yeah, Siri what do you expect? again? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I don't know. Some some sort of in between feels like the mm -hmm. right mode. Like you're not my friend. You're a tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jason, do you feel that a open AI search product is inevitable? 
Yeah, one hundred percent. I I would be really surprised if uh, if OpenAI didn't do some sort of a search product um, at some point or some sort of integration. I mean, I'm a big fan of Perplexity. Perplexity is kind of the the platform that I've used a lot um, in in the last handful of months, and it it does a lot of these kind of search like qualities. Like like the way I think about using perplexity is if I have an idea to go do a search, sometimes I'll open up perplexity and just do it there instead and see what it comes back with. And oftentimes I'm presented with more that I didn't know I was looking for and some organization around that and everything. I think at the end of the day, Google's, you know, obviously doing this with their their search product. OpenAI's got to do it because they all want to kind of, you know, keep pace with each other. And and I think really at the end of the day, uh, search is the is is just a natural target. Target um, AI is really good for search, um, uh, but you know, is search good for AI? I think it it, it probably is too. But it depends on if you're running an AI company. That's probably how you feel. Search is definitely good for AI if you run an AI company because it's well, a lot of information. It's a lot of information. That's a lot what of the, information. The thing is. Yeah. And, you know, Jason, thank you so much for bringing so much information to us. Uh, we yeah. could talk about this all day and we will continue the conversation on Good Day Internet uh, after we wrap up uh, DTNS. But before we do, wanted to uh, uh, share a little tip from Chris Christensen from the Am- Amateur Traveler, who is explaining how an in-flight entertainment feature on JetBlue might make your next flight more enjoyable. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. Here's a feature that JetBlue has rolled out that I'm not sure I care about, but as part of their new in-flight entertainment called Blueprint, the system will let you and five other passengers watch the same film or TV show in sync. It's called Watch Parties. And I know friends who do that all the time, especially during the pandemic, But I know when I'm on a plane, I don't care if anybody else is on the plane. I'm on my own little bubble. Is this something you would use? Are you looking forward to watch parties where you can all watch the same film at the same time during your flight? If so, JetBlue is the place for it. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I I can think of times. Yeah. (laughs) Five of us are going, you know, to a bachelorette party, you know, across country. We're on a JetBlue flight. Like, let's all watch Bridesmaids together. (laughs) You know, I I know that's like like a sort of an obvious example, but I could see this working. I could see this. Yeah, I see this with families, actually. Um, you know, my kids are much older now, but there were definitely times when I was flying with our kids, with our two daughters when they were younger, where I where I would either want to watch that movie with them and there was no easy way to do that. Or, you know, the two of them watch on one screen the same thing or however we could figure it out. Um, I could totally see it with families. Yeah. Well, Jason Howell, thank you so much for being with us today. Let folks know uh, when you, uh, you know, you uh, have a nap after (laughs) (laughs) I.O. Let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. Well, I mean, you know, I.O. was sort of Android. So AndroidFaithful.com here on the DTNS network. We actually have a new site that we're really proud of. And uh, it looks great. It does. Thank you. We're doing some written content for for there and some developer interviews. Went to a DAO is doing those. So we're we got a lot of plans for that. Um, but then I also do an AI show, which is the other half of Google I.O. So uh, AI Inside dot show me and Jeff Jarvis every week. Uh, this week, we actually had Mike Elgin on to talk all about all the, the AI news that, uh, you know, some of which we covered today. So go to those places. Thank you for the invite. As always, it was really fun to hang out with you. Well, it's always good to have you, um, and thank you, too. Uh, Patrons, if you are a patron, do stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We will be expanding a little bit more on non-AI stuff from IO, because there was some, and get more thoughts from Jason from the event. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Patrick Norton and Lynn Peralta. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)